with Senator Mike Lee from Utah. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Here to talk a little bit about your book you released this summer, uh, Our Lost Constitution. I wanted to start off, you know, why why did you decide to write a book? Uh, you know, it seems to have a great reception so far. I decided to write Our Lost Constitution because I've come to believe that most of the problems we have in the federal government can be traced to a deviation away from the norms established in our founding document. This document was written some 229 years ago in Philadelphia during that hot, fateful, sweltering summer. Over time, we started to neglect parts of the Constitution. There are a number of provisions that, while still in effect, while they've never been repealed, or replaced, or changed meaningfully, have been neglected to the point that you can say that they've been diminished or lost, as I describe it in the book. So the purpose of this book is to reinvigorate uh, and re-inject these provisions back into our national political discourse. Because it's my belief we can't count on the courts anymore to restore provisions, every provision of the Constitution. Sometimes we can. A lot of the time, uh, that kind of change comes about only when the people themselves become aware of the problem, become aware of the Constitution, and start discussing it in their day-to-day -day political discussion. Right, right. So what, so what are some of these provisions that you touch on in the book? Two of the most important features in the Constitution that I discuss in the book are federalism and separation of powers. These are the twin structural protections. I discuss separation of powers in Chapter 3. I discuss federalism and the Tenth Amendment in Chapter 6. Uh, each of these protections operates on an, on an axis. We have the vertical protection we call federalism, which says that most of the power is supposed to remain close to the people at the state and local level. Only a few powers are supposed to be lost in the federal government. Uh, think of national defense, weights and measures, regulating uh, trade between the states with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. Everything else is supposed to remain close to the people. The horizontal protection is uh, the one we call separation of powers, which says that one branch, Congress, the branch I worked in, uh, it makes the laws. The executive branch, headed by the president, enforces the laws. The judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court, interprets the laws. We've gotten away from both of these protections in that we've turned both of them on their heads. Uh, federalism is totally backwards now. Uh, the powers of the federal government are vast, and those reserved to the states are now diminished, and, and, and uh, it's supposed to be quite the opposite. With separation of powers, we now have the executive branch making most of the law. 80,000 pages a year as compared to a few hundred pages a year uh, actually made by Congress. So... Um, uh, our, our, our neglect of, of the Tenth Amendment and federalism and separation of powers, uh, the, those, are, um, those are two of, of the most important features of the book, and I, and I talk in the book uh, about how we can restore them and how you can discern which candidates care about these principles Interesting. and That's, vote accordingly. How, how, how do you do that? Well, I, I propose in the book, I, I do this um, uh, near the end uh, of the book, uh, where I propose a certain uh, series of questions or certain categories of questions that are designed to ask a candidate where he or she stands on the limits on federal power. Before you support any candidate for federal office, uh, House or Senate or otherwise, it, that candidate should be willing to state unequivocally what he or she believes about the power of the federal government. And, and if they give you a vague answer, don't accept that. <laughs> or, or if they do give you a vague answer and that's all they're willing to give, don't support that candidate. You need to get specific with each candidate and ask each candidate to say, Here's where I think the limits are. Here's where I think the federal government is currently exceeding its power. Here's where I think uh, uh, we've deviated from separation of powers, and here's what I would do to restore federalism and separation of powers. No, I think that's a great outline uh, for people who are you know, talking to these candidates, especially at the local level, is really you know, hit them hard with these, these questions and see where they, where they fall. So that's great. What else, uh, you know, I, obviously outlining a lot of the issues and where these provisions are being attacked, do you see any any progress being made though to protect any of them? Any of these you know attacks being reversed? Any, anything there? Sure, um, there are some success stories uh, within the book. I talk a lot about the Fourth Amendment in Chapter Five. Um, in Chapter Five, we discuss the Fourth Amendment how it's been weakened over time. I tell the uh, and in each instance in each chapter, I tell the story behind uh, the constitutional provision at issue where it came from, why we have it, and then I tell some modern stories about it as well. I tell the story about uh, John Wilkes. John Wilkes was a member of uh, the British Parliament uh, back in the 1760s, 
at a time when he was uh, arrested. He was arrested for criticizing King George III and, and King George III's ministers. Um, he did so in a publication called North Britain Number 45. He had these, these weeklies that would come out. They were each numbered sort of like the Federalist Papers. And um, King George III and his ministers said, ah, that's enough, we won't be criticized anymore. So they arrested him, they searched his house. John Wilkes fought back, and he said, no, this is um, in violation of my fundamental rights as an Englishman. He sued, and he won not only his liberty, but he won a judgment for money damages against the king's ministers. Wow. This was unheard of in yeah. those days. But as a result of that, John Wilkes became a hero. And John Wilkes and the number 45, uh, representing uh, North Britain number 45, which is what got him in trouble, became a rallying cry uh, for champions of liberty on both sides of the Atlantic. I then go on to tell the story of how uh, this is why the Fourth Amendment got put into the Constitution, because uh, the, the basis upon which John Wilkes won his liberty was that they were using these general warrants that basically said, go find the bad guys uh, wherever they are. Didn't have to name the bad guys or what, what was going to be searched, who was going to be subject to the warrant. Uh, and that's why we have the Fourth Amendment, which says that to get a search warrant, you have to have particular information. Particularity is a requirement in our Fourth Amendment that says uh, you have to state the, the, the person subject to the search and the things subject to it with uh, reasonable particularity. Um, so that's why we have it. It's been weakened in recent years where the federal government was collecting telephone data, calling data on every telephone number in America without regard to whether that telephone number was connected to any number suspected of terrorist activity. Um, but we stopped that with the USA Freedom Act, a bill that I authored uh, that ended up passing along bipartisan lines that ended bulk data collection in connection with, um, with your usage of telephones. So that's a success story in the book, and that's an example I point to of how we as a people can reinvigorate other provisions of the Constitution that have been neglected or lost. That's great. Now, how do you see, how do you see the book tying in with your Article 1 project that you're working okay. on? I'm sure there's a lot, of, a lot of overlap there, maybe with some of the... You know, provisions and that are, that are being attacked. So, yeah. I, I've started uh, an, an internal think tank within right. Congress called the Article One Project, along with my friend Jeff Henserling, and there we've got a total of ten members of Congress. It's a bicameral exercise to try to reinvigorate um, uh, Congress's lawmaking right. function, it, and it ties in perfectly with what I discuss in chapters one and three of the book, um, and to some extent with chapter two. In that, in the book, I explained that we have deviated dangerously from the Constitution's formula for making law. Um, the very first clause of the first section of the first article of the Constitution says, "All legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in a Congress, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives." And then Article One, Section Seven sets the formula for making law. You can't make law in this country. You cannot make federal law in this country without. Uh, that law passing the House and passing the Senate and um, uh, getting past the President's veto. Um, and the book explains how Congress has bypassed that by delegating lawmaking power. Instead of passing actual laws that actually deal with the problem, we'll identify a problem, like say clean air, and instead of passing a law explaining how we're going to regulate clean air, we say we shall have clean air. And EPA gets to decide what clean air is, and EPA gets to set pollution limits and enforce those limits and assess penalties, and we're not on the hook. The reason that's a problem, as I explain in the book, is because executive branch bureaucrats, no matter how hardworking, well-intentioned, uh, and well-educated they are, don't work for you. You can't fire them. Uh, my constituents have the discretion to fire me every six years as a U.S. Senator. My House colleagues can be fired every two years by their voters. But you cannot fire a government bureaucrat. That's the problem, and I explained that at length in my book. And so the, the Article One project and the, the discussions, particularly in chapters one through three of the book, uh, tie in very nicely with the Article One project, um, uh, because that's what we're trying to do, is restore and reinvigorate Congress's accountability to the people. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time to join us. I want to remind people again, our lost constitution, uh, easily find it online, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you can easily find it online. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and I've got a Facebook page That's called right. Our yeah. Lost Constitution. Please visit that page and, and, and like it. I, I uh, would love to have you part of that online discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.